On the 20th of November, 1943, one of the bloodiest battles in American history began. The target was a tiny island called Tarawa. Tarawa was the most strongly defended island in the Pacific, with awesome fortifications and crack Japanese troops. The Japanese as an enemy were very determined by the Bushido Code, which says stand and die. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. The Japanese boasted that a million Americans couldn't take the island in a hundred years. So you put that combination of lethal fire with determined men in concealed positions, and it's going to be a ghastly carnage. On Tarawa, the Marines faced their sternest test yet. Individual Marines took the island bit by bit, gun by gun. It never lit up until the very end, and for at least two days, the, the outcome was very much in doubt. High above the island, reconnaissance aircraft charted the course of the battle. Many of these priceless photographs were later lost or forgotten. Newly rediscovered, they shed unprecedented light on the battle for Tarawa, a ferocious 76-hour conflict that shaped the course of the Pacific War. AM, November the 20th, 1943. America was about to strike the first major offensive blow in the battle for the Central Pacific. The target was a tiny island, less than three miles long and 800 yards wide, called Tarawa. Tarawa was in the middle of nowhere, but with its vital airfield, it was the first step in the island hopping strategy that would lead to Japan. The 2nd Marine Division, back from their bloody victory on Guadalcanal, had to take Tarawa. Also heading to the island was combat cameraman Norm Hatch. Tarawa was the first Pacific battle that was comprehensively and successfully filmed. Being on Tarawa with a camera was like being in a candy store because there was something happening in every direction you looked. You couldn't avoid having a story to tell. The film made of the invasion with the Marines at Tarawa went on to win an Oscar. These are the men of the 2nd Marine Division. We're now embarking on a full-scale amphibious operation after many months of intensive training. Pitted against the Marines were 5,000 men, including an elite Japanese outfit, the Riku Sentai, or Imperial Marines. We knew that without a doubt that these were very tenacious, competent uh, troops, that they would, they would fight to the, to the last man, and that uh, they would probably, most of them would never surrender. On the island was a Japanese officer called Kiyoshi Ota. He wrote down his recollections of the battle. They were the only Japanese record of the Tarawa campaign to survive. Before daylight, all hands were informed that the enemy fleet was gathered near the entrance to the lagoon. The commanding officer then said to us, the rise and fall of our motherland may well rest on our last decisive battle. Let us exhibit our samurai spirit and try our best. These extraordinary aerial photographs show how Kiyoshi Ota and his fellow Japanese soldiers had turned Tarawa into an island fortress. With 500 pillboxes and machine gun nests, trenches and foxholes, it was the most heavily defended island the Marines had attacked in the Pacific. At the center of this ring of steel was the airfield. The entire island bristled with uh, gunnery, bristled with defenders. Tarawa's first line of defense was the reef that ringed the island. 
Experts were unable to tell from the aerial photographs how deep the water was above the reef. Gauging the correct depth was crucial to the outcome of the attack. The reef was a big problem. It was a big problem because it was unknown how bad or how high the reef was, particularly at low tide. The debate before the battle was, would there be enough water on this particular day to get not only the Amtraks over, but the Higgins boats, which required at least about four feet of water. Amtraks, amphibious tractors, had never been used in combat before. The Marines hoped this innovation would help them scale the reef. It was capable of going in the water and capable of also moving on land. It had uh, wheels uh, somewhat like a, a tank. And uh, that's what uh, my company and uh, other companies landed in, but uh, they didn't have many of those. In fact, the Marines only had enough Amtraks for the first three waves of attacks. After that, the troops would be in Higgins boats that required four feet of water in order to get over the reef. If there were insufficient water over the reef at invasion hour, the Higgins boats would be stranded high and dry and the Marines would have to wade ashore into the teeth of the enemy guns. Despite concerns over the reef, the High Command gave the go-ahead for the assault. The battle for Tarawa began. Phase one opened with a massive bombardment designed to annihilate the Japanese before the Marines landed. It was the biggest scene so far in the Pacific. For three days before we moved in, over four million pounds of explosives had been dropped on the island. It didn't seem possible that anyone could live through that bombardment. Oh, it's just uh, tremendous amounts of noise and, and uh, bright lights, but there was so much smoke hanging over the island that you couldn't tell where the smoke ended and the land began. You'd have thought everybody would have been annihilated. <laughs> we thought, honestly, that, man, all we gotta do is dig a bunch of graves and this battle's over. But the naval bombardment was a dismal failure. The trouble with the Navy bombarding is the trajectory of uh, battleships, 15 East guns, is quite flat. So uh, those were of no value. They just kind of bounced off. Inside their bunkers, the Japanese were battered and bruised, but they had survived. When the bombardment ended, they raced to the north of the island to face the American invasion. Aerial reconnaissance images show the plan of attack. The Marines aimed to land on three invasion beaches on the north of the island, codenamed Red 1, Red 2, and Red 3. As we approach the island, we have the feeling that the show is just about over. There doesn't seem to be any organized resistance. However, we're taking no chances. The first three waves of Amtraks scaled the reef and headed to the shore. But the Japanese, who had survived the naval bombardment, were about to unleash a firestorm onto the landing craft. We could see the American landing craft coming towards us like dozens of spiders scattering over the surface of the water. One of my men exclaimed, heavens, the god of death has come. The first sign that, that we were not gonna have an easy road of it was that uh, when the amphibious tractors were headed into the beach, uh, they encountered heavy fire. The machine gun fire penetrated the port side when we started moving off. And I don't know how many casualties it caused. All I know is I had uh, a squad and a half in there and only four of us got out of that. The killing intensified with the next waves of Higgins boats. As the skeptics feared, the low tide left them stranded on the reef. The Marines were sitting ducks. Now we fetched up on the reef as we expected to do, and then the ramp wouldn't go down. So. Everybody had to go up over the side. As we went off the boat, we started receiving very heavy small arms fire. 
uh, you could hear the uh, the bullets uh, singing by, and you could see the splashing occurring all all through the water all around you. The first Amtrak finally made it onto Red Beach One on Tarawa, but it had been a costly landing. I landed with the chief corpsman, a fine young man. He was early 20s, well trained, very likable, very dedicated, wanted to become a doctor. We jumped out of the landing craft. I happened to jump out on this side and he jumped out, I think, on the other side. And as we got out, he let out a shriek and a yell. He'd been shot in the, in the leg. I gave him some of my Badisto brandy that I had in my canteen. I had two canteens. I wish I'd had both my Badisto brandy. So I told him I'd come back in a half an hour. And I wanted to get him out of there if I could. He was dead when I got back. As the sun beat down on the exhausted Marines, the trauma of Tarawa had only just begun. One thousand five hundred men of the second division of the U.S. Marines had landed on the tiny island of Tarawa. When we landed on the island the first morning, I said to myself, I'm going to survive this operation. Tarawa was the most heavily fortified island in the Pacific. What had begun as a smooth operation was beginning to go awry. I knew as we were landing, we started getting fire from the from the beach, and uh, it didn't take long to realize that things were really tough. One of my young men, he stood up trying to see what was ahead, and the first round of hitting, and of course that round almost decapitated him. The impact threw him to the back of the LVT. And I said, welcome to Tarawa. These extraordinary aerial photographs help chart the progress of the battle. Units had come ashore onto Red Beach One. They had suffered appalling casualties. I would guess half of the casualties occurred in the first few hours that Marines were on the beach. We were undefended, we had no, no protection. We knew the Japanese were there. They were firing everything they had, but they were behind embankments that we couldn't reach. That took probably half of our total casualties. On Red Beach, too, it was just as bad. Some companies had lost 50% of their men. It was pandemonium because there was so many officers got killed. There was. Uh, troops that, that didn't really have their own leader. They were following another person. There's no place else to go, only forward. And that's what we kept on doing. As naval gunfire from destroyers in the lagoon blitzed the island, more troops tried to make it ashore onto Red Beach 3 to the north. A pier offered the Marines some limited protection from deadly Japanese fire. There were people who would just kind of drop from sight, and I, I'm assuming that they were, they were hit somewhere, uh, or in some cases, maybe they couldn't swim, and they hit a hole and just, just went down. Well, I was wet, and I was angry, uh, and uh, then as I arrived there, there were a couple of Marines under the pier, and they gave me a, ha a hand up onto the um, pilings that, that were holding the pier up. These recently rediscovered aerial photographs help us pinpoint the action on the ground. The beach was still hundreds of yards away. Japanese gunfire raked the area. Suddenly, someone come run came running from behind me and grabbed my rifle. And I said, uh, hey, where are you going with my rifle? And this kid turned around and ran back and he said, oh, pardon me, I thought you were dead. <laughs> By mid-morning of D-Day, the survivors were pinned down behind a seawall on the northern beaches. And there were a lot of Marines holed up behind that wall. I asked them if there was 
any officers around. Someone gave me a sort of a catatonic stare. Climbing over the seawall meant almost certain death, but staying put was not an option. My combat sense was offended by all those men in a bunch on that beach. And I said, uh, well, I said, we, we had to get these people off the beach before mortars start coming in. And we uh, took off, got over the beach into a huge shallow hole. It was big enough for the four of us. And uh, we were the front line. To make matters worse, a new problem had emerged. Seawater had drenched and destroyed the TBY portable radios that the Marines relied on to communicate with each other and coordinate attacks. When I went off into the water, immediately that TBY went about two-thirds under the water. It was so saturated with salt water that there was virtually no point in keeping it. It, it just wasn't going to work. The Marines were scattered and isolated on the most formidable Japanese stronghold in the Pacific. These revealing aerial images give us an extraordinary insight into the complex interlocking defenses that Japanese engineers had constructed right across the island. You had these pillboxes so craftily concealed that some of the Marines at the seawall were being fired upon by Japanese six feet away and they couldn't see them. They had bunkers that uh, take a direct hit from a 14-inch shell to get rid of them. If you um, killed one or two of them, some others would take over the gun. With the Marines pinned down on the beach, Japanese officer Kiyoshi Ota launched a one-man attack. I jumped over the barricade. My men did not follow me as I had ordered. I waved my sword at the Marines as if to cut them down. Then I came to my senses, jumped quickly back over the barricade, and returned to my position. The Japanese hurled massive firepower onto the Marines who lay scattered on the beach. The Marine commander, David Shoup, finally made it onto Red Beach too. He took control of the chaotic situation. He pulled together the scattered units and tried to direct the attack. He made decisions, key decisions under fire, on Tarawa that I think uh, probably were instrumental in uh, alleviating some of our stress. He was a very fine man. Disaster piled upon disaster. Reinforcements were sent ashore. More Marines were stranded on the reef. The Japanese now had the range to perfection. The slaughter intensified. Those poor devils had to try to wade in through that water. And machine guns were just chopping the water into, into foam around them. From our vantage point, you could, you could see them just being just, just cut to ribbons out there with the small arms fire as they get off these boats in, in chest deep or, or neck deep water. And they just had to face a uh, just a barrage of fire all the way in. That was the worst sight I saw in World War II. It had been the bloodiest American landing of the Pacific War to date. 1,500 men out of the 5,000 strong attack force were dead, wounded, or missing. By the evening of the first day, Disaster was staring the Marines in the face. By the time that dusk set in, and we saw that sun go down beyond the Pacific waters, uh, uh, everything got very quiet. That first evening, I was certain that there was going to be a massive counterattack. I was absolutely sure. The evening of the 20th of November, 1943, promised to turn into the longest and bleakest nights any of them had ever known. Dawn broke over Tarawa. The Paradise Island had become a bloody battleground. 
Dead bodies littered the shore. But the Marines had at least survived the night. I was very, very happy to be alive and, and uh, well and, and somewhat refreshed uh, on, uh, on day two. We were expecting a, a big attack. We thought it would come any time. We were just as sure as we could be that it was coming because actually, I think, had they done it, they might have been able to drive us off the island. The nighttime counterattack that could have driven the Marines back into the sea never materialized. Unbeknownst to the Americans, the previous day, the Japanese commander, Admiral Shibasaki, and his officers had been caught in the open. During the first day, a group of officers, including Admiral Shibasaki, uh, left his, the bomb proof to move from the lagoon side closer to the ocean side, where he had another command post set up. Well. Uh, someone spotted that group of officers and called in a destroyer salvo. And so a destroyer laying out there put in a heavy charge on them and killed them all, nobody knowing that that was the commanding general of the Japanese forces. The Marines had no idea that with a single broadside, they had taken out Admiral Shibasaki, the key Japanese commander. In his trench, Kiyoshi Ota was isolated and leaderless. He was one of the few Japanese officers left alive on the island. We did not know what to believe or what to do because we had practically no communication with our command centers. They didn't attack because they were as fouled up as we were. Their communications had been shot up, and uh, a lot of them had been killed, and I think that there was, there's no, they, they couldn't attack. Fresh Marine reinforcements, which had been out at sea for almost 24 hours, finally hit Tarawa. But Japanese machine gun fire made it a slow and bloody landing. It took me about four hours to get to the beach. But I could see what was happening, and I saw four or five people who got hit, you know, who, who were hurt. When I got in, I saw a sergeant for our battalion. I told him that I left my radio at the end of the pier so it would stay dry. And he said, he looked at me, he says, go get it, we need it. <laughs> I had to go back. <laughs> With reinforcements ashore, the Marines regrouped and prepared to push inland. From this vantage point, it's possible to follow the action. The Marines had a tiny toehold on the island. They held pockets of ground on the north coast on Red Beaches 1, 2, and 3. The objective on day two was to link up the scattered Marine units, take the airfield in the center of the island, and try to push across Tarawa. Everything was dicey because the Japanese were so well hidden that uh, we might think that we had secured an area and somebody would pop out over here and be in our back and, uh, and, and do some damage. In the Tarawa killing zone, a combat cameraman made a perfect target. I don't know what the Japanese must have thought of me when they saw me because I'm the only guy standing up walking around. I can't shoot laying down on the ground. You have to walk around and do it. These revealing aerial photographs show just what the Marines were up against. The Japanese had built a series of seemingly impregnable defenses. The Japanese opposition was too strong for the Marines to move inland on the northern beaches, so they had to suddenly change their plan. In mid-battle, they improvised and decided to attack Green Beach on the west of the island instead. We had to do something. We had very little to do it with. We got some naval gunfire from destroyers to fire for effect for about 20 or 30 minutes before we were supposed to jump off. We had a couple of Sherman tanks that had still survived, and uh, we had some machine gun support. Precision naval gunfire from nearby destroyers silenced the Japanese defenders. 
the Marines, supported by the first two Shermans to see action in the Pacific, drove down the west coast. There was a nice combination of uh, infantry, tank, and uh, destroyer support. Once the attack started around 11 in the morning, it only took about an hour for them to secure all of Green Beach. It was an organized, by the book attack. We used a lot of flamethrowers. We used a lot of hand grenades. We found that smoke grenades were very effective. You throw a smoke grenade in a covered place where there are six persons with a machine gun, they don't last very long. By 12.30 on the second day, the Marines had scored their first victory on Tarawa. And what's so crucial about that is that you had um, a pretty much a, a secure beach to bring in not just just throw in units of Marines, but you could throw in the entire unit, the entire battalion. When they came ashore, they were a reinforced battalion of about 1,200 men. Had all their equipment, they were fresh. They knew what lay ahead of them. With fresh troops and equipment ashore, the Marines were poised to drive east across the island. By 4 p.m., they had made it to the central runway and a tiny unit raced to the south coast and dug in. By early evening of the second day, the Marines were finally on the move. Racing to keep up with the advancing Marines was combat cameraman Norm Hatch. I sat down to do a reload, and, and I thought the sand was awfully hard. Sort of pushed the sand aside. It was filled with Kieran beer. The Kieran beer tasted so sweet and so clean and so nice. We'd take two bottles out, and each would tie it to his belt. Run out, when we were up front shooting someplace, uh, in a little lull, we'd say, anybody like a beer? <laughs> and of course, we'd get that look on everybody's face. What the hell is this guy doing? That was one of the lighter moments uh, of the uh, battle. Lighter moments came few and far between on Tarawa, as the battle for the island reached fever pitch. We were knew that they couldn't go anywhere, and they didn't want to go anywhere. So we, we knew that they were, they were going to fight till the last person, which they did. As night fell on day two, Japanese troops regrouped for a counterattack the next morning. They were determined to make the Marines pay dearly for every inch of Tarawa's soil. Six a.m., November the twenty-second, nineteen forty-three. By the third day of the battle for Tarawa, a grim determination had gripped the Japanese garrison. Kiyoshi Ota was one of the last officers left alive. Our men could not speak; their faces were pale. We were surrounded by an overwhelming force of the enemy, with no hope for outside support or assistance. We knew that we would die one after another as cherry blossoms fall, or autumn leaves are scattered. The Marines had an awesome task. They had to advance east across the island, but to do so, they had to take out each pillbox and foxhole. It was dirty and dangerous work. Everywhere you look, there was an emplacement or a machine gun or something like that to attack. There wasn't any cover. There was this small plot of sand. You couldn't go anywhere. And so you had two crack outfits just, just going at each other incessantly. It isn't easy knocking those Japs out of their positions. They're hidden in trees, behind revetments, buried pillboxes, bomb proofs, bunkers. Anywhere on Tarawa, you were subject to death at any moment. The Marines pushed to the east. There was a stronghold of Japanese resistance at the pocket and concentrations of Japanese troops on the eastern end of the island. New ways of waging war evolved on Tarawa to cope with this deadly enemy. These methods came to dominate the Pacific campaign. It was just 
piece-by-piece piece operation. As you come up and find a foxhole area, you'd have to approach it carefully and eventually hopefully get a grenade in it or a flamethrower, and it was that type of action. This was a battle of little groups led by the strongest man in the group, who may have been a lieutenant or a captain, but in all probability was a corporal or a sergeant. And uh, they take the initiative because it was obvious what had to be done. The battles were ferocious and intense. The Marines used every weapon at their disposal to root out the enemy. We use all the firepower we have to blast them out. Our rifle fire is dead. So are the flamethrowers and the mortars. If you put the flamethrower and aim it on this foxhole over here, 75 yards away, you don't have to leave it there very long. Even if they don't get hit with the fire, they can't breathe for a few seconds, and it usually scares the daylights out of them. If you can get a flamethrower to do that three or four times on foxholes, you're beginning to get less fire. By the afternoon of day three, the Marines who were pushing east had made it halfway across the island. But in no man's land, a new danger confronted them. This was a war without front lines. Snipers infested the island. Nip suicide snipers tie themselves up in the trees and take pot shots at us. We hit them, but they don't fall. Just die and hang there. I noticed as I ran out, one of the machine gunners had been hit in the back, and I heard some, some shots that sounded like they were coming from behind me. And I looked around, and I, there was only one palm tree there that still had a lot of fronds on it. So I figured if they were shooting from behind us, it had to be from up there. So I just emptied my rifle into the palm tree. And the next time I ran out, I didn't hear any shots coming from behind. The air crackled with sniper fire. Slaughter also lurked underground. We discovered that there was this another submerged tank turret. And I saw a rifle being drawn back in just as I did that. I said, there's the SOB right there. Well, when the flamethrower hit it, the door burst open. He broke out and he started running and all the ammunition belts on him started going off because he was all on fire. And bullets were flying in every direction. Now we hit the ground. I didn't want to get hit by a bullet that nobody fired, you know. That was the one time in the Pacific War I didn't get the shot I should have. By day three, Tarawa had been pockmarked by bombs and incinerated by explosives. In the searing Pacific heat, the island had become a stinking graveyard where the dead lay side by side with the living. I just remember it as one hot hell hole once the bodies started decaying than they do early in a case like this. Then the smell did become pretty, pretty tough. Miraculously though, some life had survived. I heard some sound as we went by a very damaged Japanese tank and, and it sounded like a person crying, but I wasn't quite sure. And I saw two eyes and I knew that they were too close to be human, so it had to be an animal. So Kelly found the top of, a, of an old coffee pot, and I took that and I poured some of my canteen water in it and held it there under the tread, and she came forth very slowly but uh, carefully and then began to drink the water. It had been a costly advance, but by the end of D-Day plus two, Marines controlled two thirds of the island. Suicidal defiance gripped the Japanese defenders. Kiyoshi Ota, one of the last Japanese officers alive, joined one of the suicide squads as they launched their most terrifying attack yet. There were the sounds of grenade explosions, the disordered fire of rifles, the shrieks, yells and roars. It was just like hell. We repelled a lot of bonsai attacks. 
But when they did come, they come head first right at you and they'd wait till the middle of the night. It was a, uh, an attack off to our right flank. There may have been 40 or 50 uh, that charged, uh, but they were, they were charging right straight into very heavy machine gun fire. They got in, some of them, they got through. You tried to shoot them with your rifle before they could get their bayonet to you. As dawn broke on day four, one thing was clear. There would be no surrender. Taking Tarawa was now a war of extermination. The fourth day of the battle for Tarawa began with a massive naval and aerial bombardment. The Marines controlled most of the tiny Pacific island, but key Japanese strongholds still remained. Aerial photographs give us an overview of the action. To the east, the Japanese were still dug in. And on the boundary of Red Beaches 1 and 2, a pocket of strong Japanese resistance remained. To take the island, the Marines had to overcome the most desperate resistance of the campaign so far. They had to storm each Japanese stronghold to root out the enemy. And they were determined, and they were told that they, they were not going to lose it. That, and they believed it. And they're, they're ready to die for, for their cause. They're savage fighters. Their lives mean nothing to them. Inside their defenses, the Japanese were all but invincible. But out in the open, they were easy targets. All of a sudden, somebody to my left yelled, here come the Japs. And I, all I, I never didn't move. All I did was turn my body and the camera. And I had in the frame, and this is the unusual part of it, in a sense, I had the frame, one of our machine gunners. And then in the background, there are two squads of Japanese Marines who have come out of the command post, and they didn't have a chance in the world. They were annihilated. But it was the first time I know in the Pacific War that American troops were shown in the same frame with the enemy fighting. While some Marines tackled the pocket of pillboxes on the northern shore, other units battled the Japanese strongholds on the east of Tarawa. The Japanese were now outnumbered and outgunned. They fought ferociously to stem the tide of advancing Marines. There was a large pillbox and they got some grenades into that. And it just, it, it suddenly, it seemed like 20 or 30 Japanese came running out of a small opening and, and running down a, a trench. And we had one tank in the area, and he happened to be in just the right position. And he devastated this, this group that were exiting the, uh, the one pillbox. Desperation set in for the beleaguered Japanese. You would find the dead Japanese who had committed suicide because capture was beyond their belief. And it, it, was, uh, it was a dishonor, it would dishonor the family. So you had all that kind of pressure going against them to make them stand and die. By mid-morning, the Marines had gained the upper hand. The resistance was getting lighter. When we would find an active machine gun nest, we would kind of surround it and bypass it. So we were, we were wiping them out from behind as we proceeded on down the island. The Japanese were attacked pillbox by pillbox, man by man. It's tough getting them out of places like this. We take it slow, easy. The Marines ground down the opposition. By lunchtime on day four, the final Japanese strongholds fell. Around noon of the final day, the, the, the Marines reached the end of, of the eastern tip of Tarawa. At just about the same time, the Marines battle in the pocket, the place that put up such stiff opposition, they finally overwhelmed it. For the Marines of the 2nd Division, the battle for Tarawa was over. 
It had been a short but uniquely savage operation. On an island which is not quite one third the size of Central Park in New York, 6,000 people were killed, 2,000 people were wounded, all in the space of 76 hours. The 5,000 strong Japanese garrison had been all but wiped out. Kiyoshi Ota was the only enemy officer left. The Americans found me still alive in the dugout and took me prisoner. They dressed my wounds and gave me a full meal. The US Marines treated each other with consideration, but treated me, an enemy, as if I were their friend. This was just the opposite of the treatment we had been taught to expect. These are Marine dead. This is the price we have to pay you for a war we didn't want. And before it's over, there'll be more dead on other battlefields. We knew we had lost a tremendous number of people. We had no idea that this, this was going to go down as a, uh, some kind of an epic uh, amphibious landing. A thousand Marines had died in 76 hours of fighting. The cost of the battle appalled many Americans. The film made of the operation brought home to the public the reality of war. The director of public information uh, for the Marine Corps, when, when asked about it later, said that recruiting fell off dramatically for a while after that film hit the public and, uh, and was displayed in all the movie houses across the country. Despite the deaths and disasters, Tarawa had lessons for the attack plan of the entire Pacific campaign. Can a group of uh, soldiers, in this case Marines, can they land against a defended beachhead and successfully uh, dislodge it? Well, Taro showed that it, in spite of all the um, horrors, of course, that it brought with it, it did show that it could succeed. So this unknown speck of sand had uh, quite drastic repercussions for the rest of the war. With the airfield they'd captured and their new Central Pacific base of Tarawa, the Marines began to push towards Japan. When we start going through the Central Pacific, you're going in a much shorter route towards Tokyo and Japan. And the Japanese knew that, and uh, they fought very hard to defend it. I guess all of us knew from the first, no matter how tough the going was, that we'd take the island. Just the same, the day the colors were run up on this palm tree and flew for the first time over Tarawa, we got a lump in our throats. We were mighty proud. To me, the, the marking point of the Battle of Tarawa is this just amazing display of, of, of guts and courage to walk ashore and be willing to die if you have to, because that'll help save the guy behind you. We were delighted to get out of there. I think our, my main concern and the concern of most that we'd lost a lot of friends. You survived. You see, by golly, I survived another one. <clears throat> you just wonder well, how come you can get out of it, you know? We were Marines, and we were going to win. But we didn't expect to lose. Contemporaries saluted a battle that garnered four Congressional Medals of Honor. Time magazine wrote, Last week, some 2,000 or 3,000 United States Marines most of them now dead or wounded, gave the nation a name to stand beside the Alamo. The name was Tarawa. <laughs>